Hello and welcome. You're tuned to the League Up, your weekly thoroughbred preview podcast. We've got another week, Steve. We're on to week two. What about those snazzy new graphics? The mm, sharp, across? yeah. Very sharp indeed. Okay, we must be moving up in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. But yeah. uh, last Saturday, Imperatriz. Boy, oh boy, what an impressive effort that was. Yeah, it was very, very good. Not just on the eye, uh, Thaddeus, but backed up on the clock. High speed rating. As it was at Ruakaka, I think two contrasting performances. You had Ruakaka on a decent surface, open handicap conditions. She carried 60 kegs that day, mm-hmm. put a good field away, and the form's been uh, pretty solid. Uh, with the O'Sullivan Scott horse place and running fourth in the Memzies. Mm, um, yes. <clears throat> and then, uh, as I mentioned, Tarapa with just an outstanding performance on a heavy track, which there was a bit of trepidation leading into the market around trep- uh, around her. And Imperatriz, I think she was around about 2.10 on opening, got out to $2.50 on race day, yep. peaked at 2.50. But just the last 60 seconds, she firmed back into $2.20 Mm-hmm. to give those punters confidence that the heavy track she'd go through it and also where she sat in the map and she was just far too good for that lot. Um, mm-hmm. Look, it probably wasn't the strongest Foxbridge in terms of weight for age form that we've seen in the, fa- uh, in the past five to six years but just on her performance alone as I mentioned a very strong speed rating and, and a rating that is comparable to the likes of Melody Bell, Probabile Avantage horses that have gone over to Australia and performed and won at the elite company. So, whatever direction Tiaka want to take uh, Imperatriz, whether it's Sydney mm-hmm. or Melbourne, uh, she's a proper, proper Group One horse here and in Australia. Yeah, so, they're thinking Empire Rose, or is that the? Well, there's a million dollar bonus because she won yeah. the Tiata Breeders right. uh, at the back end of the autumn. I, I think the thing about Imperatriz and follow this this year is she went off on top. She went out on top. She had two wins in the Levin Classic and the Tiataha Breeders. Then they spelled her. So she was a happy horse in the winter. Mm. So you could back her with confidence. Yes, she needed to see a, a good trial out of it. But I love a horse that goes out in a spell over a decent period, which is the winter, winter period, on a high note. You can back them with confidence. They haven't had any niggles. They haven't had to spell because of a setback in their campaign. They've gone out on top. Mm. And it means quite often that they bounce out of that campaign and into a fresh state and a winning formula, so which we've seen, two from two. And you'd have to say she's probably the elite number one horse in the country at the moment. Yeah, onwards and upwards for her. Uh, as uh, every Friday morning, we like to say good morning to Brendan Popperwell from Hamilton. Morning, BP. She was pretty impressive. She's scaring a few off, uh, potentially in a Tarzino now. Look, she is. Uh, good morning, lads. And just around that Tarzino too, can give you an update on the prospect of track conditions at Hawke's Bay uh, as we gear up for that first uh, Group 1. Currently the track is sitting at a heavy bracket, a heavy 9, but there is, uh, and it has been a very wet winter in Hawke's Bay, but the prospect of more rain throughout next week, there is an easterly, so if there's ever an easterly in Hawke's Bay, that means the rain's going to hang around for at least three days. Uh, so there is a highly likelihood uh, that this track will be a heavy track uh, next Saturday uh, for, for the Tarzino. So what we've seen last week uh, in the Fox Bridge uh, is that she excelled in those track conditions and it's going to be very hard for any horse to try and beat her in the Group 1. La Creek, of course, is the second favourite. We've seen that runner uh, been able to perform through uh, a couple of races on, on inferior uh, track conditions. Can she be the horse that uh, can spoil the party and be the one that can beat Imperatriz? And then you start looking to horses like what Demonetization, who ran a really good race in the Foxbridge Hill, like uh, more distance and a wet track. Uh, Helena Baby, who's raced well throughout the winter and uh, has been placed in a Tarzino previously uh, a couple of seasons ago. So, yeah, I think that's an important information if you're looking to bet into that futures with the likelihood that that track at Hawke's Bay could be very wet next week. OK, that is good info. Now, look, I don't think I saw Paul Mawadi next to you today, BP. Come in, Paul. Come in, Paul. Uh, where, where are you? Where's the magical mystery tour taking you this week? Yeah, g'day boys. Uh, live here from Mount Smart Stadium, the home of the mighty Vodafone Warriors, where of course tomorrow they'll be taking on the Gold Coast Titans to finish off their season. Uh, they're currently around the $1.50 mark to beat the Titans tomorrow. Uh, five and a half point favourites and the game total is around 57 and a half, which means the bookies are expecting a few tries. And I guess young Edward Cozzy has... Uh, 
found a wee bit of form and doesn't mind dotting down here at Mount Smart, so he may be one that uh, BP is going to slot into his same game multi tomorrow. <laughs> oh yes, I tell you what, I tell you what, Paulie, uh, that game will be an absolute celebration uh, of uh, NRL uh, 2022, and uh, I reckon if it's a game where you want to chuck a lot of try scorers together, this will be one of them. David Fafita, AJ Brimson, uh, a little bit of Dallin, a little bit of Cozy, uh, a little bit of Reese Walsh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, get involved. Uh, well, Mambo, be good game number <laughs> yeah, Mambo number five. Mambo number five. You'd have to be boy. brave taking a dollar fifty, Paul. Surely you'd have to be very brave on the Warriors. Surely, or do you think they're going to get the job done at home? Look, to be fair, they have a very, very good record at Mount Smart this season. Uh, what are they? A sixty-six percent win record here in Auckland. Uh, I see no reason why they can't continue on with that sort of form. The Gold Coast Titans yet to win a game away from Seabus there in Rabina on the Gold Coast. So Warriors looking to keep them winless for the season away from home. And how were the darts last week? Girl and Price getting the job done? He certainly did. He looked very, very impressive as well. Um, I thought Bully Boy, he just couldn't find a double when he needed it. Um, so uh, if he can tidy up that sort of area of his game, um, he'll go a long, long way. But uh, Gerwin Price, uh, well deserved, and beat uh, his fellow Welshman in the final. So, mm. and it was enjoyed by everyone at the stadium. I think there was a crowd of around four or five thousand, um, and they really got into the festivities. No, very good to see. Righto, boys, we better get on to the racing. We want to start with Pops, his maidener of the week, though. BP, uh, always a popular segment. Where did you land this week for uh, your maidener of the week? Yeah, well, before we, we look at this week's Maiden of the Week, I, I do want to throw out notable mentions because I think this is a week where we do have Maiden of the Week notable mentions. Uh, Sacred Satono uh, on Wednesday uh, beating Aoti, a horse who's going to have a very good three-year preparation, one over the 970 metres. Bell of the Ball winning at Rickerton uh, was very good, a horse that we saw stakes placed. Uh, last season and Illicit Miss. I think they are three horses that are notable mentions for this week's uh, Maiden of the Week. They all impressed on the synthetic. I'm going to go to last weekend's race meeting at Tarapa in the very first race of the day because there is a lot to take in around this race. Now we spoke a lot about the track conditions and where the rail was and where you needed to be and that's how this race panned out. Uh, leader up against the rail, outside leader runs into second position. But there is a number of good runs in this race, especially the horse out wide in the yellow cap and RB from the Weatherly Barn, uh, which I know they do have a nice reputation around and the money was surrounding this horse. But there's, it's not just RB, it's Tawi as well. Uh, it's the Tiako runners. Uh, they both had strong pushes in the marketplace. Uh, I like the race. I really do like this race. And with some of those horses making ground down the centre part of the track where it was favourable early, to be up against the rail, uh, I I'm keen to follow the first race from Tadapa on Foxbridge Plate Day. Yeah, OK. She's um, quite a blanket finish there in the end, Steve. There are a few putting their uh, name forward there, so it might be a race to follow going forward. Break it down for us. Well, up to the 600 metre mark, it was real, really a sit and sprint. Uh, Thaddeus, 12 lengths below par to the 600, sprinting home one length above par for the last 600, so it really did suit. Uh, the one and two who were the first coming around the bend and they quinella the race. So, yeah, I agree with BP. you got to look at the, the performance of Tawi, Arby. As Brendan mentioned, the money was on. Mm. SP as the favourite. And also Wild Knight, who closed the fastest 6 4 2 split. So, yeah, three or four there just in behind the first two. Definitely what uh, ones to follow. On the winner, she's Seamus. I think she was a fairly cheap buy, maybe 17k at the yearling sales. Uh, a daughter by Seamus Award, and we know he's just kicking goals in the last 12 months with incentivised and duess a couple of horses in his progeny line. And I think he stands for roughly 88,000 at Rosemont Stud now, Seamus Award. So he's one of these sides that really has an upward um, trajectory in terms of his progeny kicking mm -hmm. goals, not just here, but definitely in Australia. And She's Seamus out of a Tavistock mare. So that was 1,200 metres on Saturday. You'd think 14, 16 shouldn't be any dramas. You go back to the third or fourth dam and you'll see the likes of Lonro and Catalyst on the pedigree page. So mm. yeah, a bit of work with, with that young filly and she Seamus. Yeah, OK. Exciting times ahead. And as BP mentioned, it is the week for Maidener of the Week. So the last couple of weeks and certainly the next couple of weeks as well, there'll be plenty to look out for. All right, guys, we want to have a look at four races today. A couple from Whanganui. Uh, firstly, Steve, uh, track conditions for Whanganui before we get into tuck into race number four, the O'Leary Philly Stakes. It's interesting, uh, Thaddeus. Um, mm. 
Look, we haven't raced here since I think the early stages of May Whanganui, so they've had at least two months off without no racing. Oh. There's been little rain throughout the week. In fact, the last seven days, 10 mils has hit the deck. No rain the last 24 hours. The track currently sits as a heavy 10. Now, it's been a heavy 10 right throughout uh, the week, Monday right up till Friday. <sighs> Normally, your default heavy track, Whanganui, go to the outside oh. fence. That's the lane, but I'm not 100% sure about tomorrow. I think it's going to be more that holding surface. Um, could favour on speed initially, and we'll just assess the track throughout the day, but normally your default heavy track go to the outside fence. I'm just not sure. I just want to see how the first few races play on the day. Um, the rail sits in the true position. So there'll be a nice fresh strip of grass there, knowing that we haven't raced there for a couple of months. But okay. yeah, I think it's just an assess time in terms of seeing the first two or three races unfold. But at the current stage, it's a heavy 10 uh, with the odd shower forecasted tomorrow, which may help just loosen up the track rather than that holding. OK, run us through this uh, O'Leary Philly Stakes three-year-old market, Steve. Um, yeah, quite an even market. few chances here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, very even. Headed by Labrassi at 360 for Alan Sherrick and Craig Grills. That's its opening quote. Uh, Wessex drawn the ace, four and a turn to 380. The best bat runner sits with number eight for Mark Walker and Lisa Allpress. Romancing the Moon, seven and one full point to six dollars. Best bat runner in terms of dollars invested. Aegon Alley, first up for the James Wellwood team, 650 out of turn to seven dollars. Uh, Rocket Baby the Maiden, nine out to ten is the best of the rest. And there's no real speaking for anything there. Oh, look, Gwen Stefani's probably worth a mention there. Yep. 21 peaked at 26, now into 18. But look, okay. overall summary, a race that's just fairly static in terms of dollars invested. I'll lean towards number eight and romancing the moon as your best bat runner. Mm, that's interesting. BP brings a different form line. Obviously, we're sort mm. of looking at that rider form uh, at the top of the book. And uh, Tiaki are tucking into something that snuck through from Taupo. Interesting mm. race. It, it is, it is. Um, Steve makes a great point there around track conditions. Um, I, I guess the, the, the hard point of trying to get a line on this, on, on some sort of pattern, first race is, uh, is going to be run in one breath, uh, and that being over 800 metres for the two year olds, and the two following races are over 2,040 metres. Uh, so to, to try and get a true line on, on how track conditions are going to be, uh, will be difficult with those type of races over, over those distances. Um, that, 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 that's. That's going to be the niggly part, isn't it? But I, I, I'm sort of with Steve, and you, you have to work to maybe those first few races uh, towards the rail with the track being so long uh, off the scene. Oh, look, I, I agree with what you're saying there, Thad. The, the rider stakes looks to be that right race, doesn't it? And, and we're going to see that race through both of these races for the three-year-olds. Uh, the Wizex run uh, when finishing uh, into fourth position. The, the Barassi run also in that same race uh, had a lot of merit because the Barassi had to work from a wide barrier draw and showed that early speed to try and get into a position. So it just meant that the horse used a little bit to get into a spot, but still fought on rather gamely in the race uh, to finish into sixth position, uh, did Labrassi, uh, and they have put the blinkers on uh, Alan Sherrick. So I, I like both of those horses because they, they look like they bounce out of the right race. But then you move to Romancing the Moon. Of course, that's the best seller race. That's a race that has stood up over the years. Um, the, the, the Pack and Save Topol three-odd fillies race uh, best seller showed it last season. We were keen to identify that race as one that can be followed. And she's out of a very good race mare who, who knows how to get through wet track conditions. Under the Moonlight was a, a real wet tracker uh, and, and excelled when the conditions were in the heavy bracket. And that's what she'll get tomorrow, this daughter of our rock up. So I can understand that the money move, they've put a tongue tie on, eights into six dollars. I'd be very wary. I'd be very wary of, uh, of romancing the, the, the moon here on, on a backup from that Wednesday meeting at Topol to this race meeting, despite the form around the three and the one with what they've shown at Stakes Company recently. Yeah, you'd be enjoying to see that money train, Paul, wouldn't you, around romancing the moon, or are you going with the tried and tested out of a ride of stakes? Yeah, surprise, surprise. We've got some money for a Mark Walker trained runner. Um, and you have to take notice, don't you? Especially when it comes on early. Uh, but I do like the form of the, the two at the top of the market, the coming out of that rider, as you say. And I agree with BP uh, Labrazzi. Uh, that was a tough, tough run, and she kept uh, giving down the straight. Um, so I do like um, the chances of Labrazzi. Um, and Wessex out of that uh, rider as well. Um, I can understand why those two are at the top of the market uh, and they'll be featuring in my uh, betting plans. But yes, 
alarm bells, money for a Tiaco <laughs> runner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, served our customers very well, to be fair. Um, Steve, we want to have a look at a race replay, and we're probably the obvious race to have a look at is the rider, and it'll have some benefit to the, uh, to the second race as well. Uh, break this down, Pacific Dragon getting the win this day. You see, look at the figures there. It did really suit for on-speed runners. They went to the 637 and change, 6.7 lengths below par. Charge time the last 638.61, 1.7 lengths above par. The class rating was just under par, half a length under par, so no knock there. But you do see these horses on speed. Not too much changes there. Uh, Wessex just comes in the inferior ground, cut the corner on the inside, made its, made its run from probably that neutral position and gradually finished in just from behind the placings there, Wessex, but probably an inferior ground there is a slight negative to really be into the top two into that particular race, the rider stakes, so maybe an extra tick there, knowing that it was just on that IG. Mm. Uh, Labrassi, look, she did have to face the breeze, and or he had the, or she, should I say, had to face the breeze on speed, but I don't think it was... The way the race shape unfolded, I think it was an OK position. I'd rather a horse sit three wide on speed when they've sit and sprinted home than sitting in that neutral position. So on paper it might say it was a tough run, but I still feel Labrassi was in the right position considering the race and the way the track was playing coming down the centre part of the home straight halfway through the card. So um, yeah, interesting race. They do have the winning form in terms of race win, Labrassi mm. and Wessex and black type form. but. With Romancing the Moon, uh, yeah. with Tiaka, they do bounce out of those one-start performances and really lift in the ratings. And as you mentioned, comes out of that race and behind bestseller. It really did suit on, uh, horses that were off-speed. Bestseller was in that last to second outer position and finished over the top of them mm. after going uh, roughly, I think, 4.2 lengths above par to the 600 metre mark. So a horse like Romancing the Moon, who was on speed, was in the first two or three in running, boxed on well. It was never a winning chance in terms of down the straight, uh, in, the, in terms of a, a beating margin was uh, well and truly beaten. But as I mentioned, that was its first up run. It's got natural improvement. Uh, it's a big improver, comes out of the right stable. And Lisa Allpress jumps aboard here, which I think is a key engagement. Look for her rides throughout the day at Whanganui. Just on a few stats around Lisa Allpress. 133 wins she's had at Whanganui. Mm -hmm. That's the third highest in terms of wins on a certain track behind Alpuni and Rickerton. Her okay. career strike rate sits roughly at 12%, which averages out one a meeting. Yep. When it gets to Whanganui, her strike rate sits at 16%. So okay. she's one jockey that I think early doors knows the track yeah. inside out or identify where to put her horses in when it comes to the last four or 500 metres, whether she stays close to the inside or makes her way to the centre, the outer part of the track. So just keep an eye on Lisa Allpress's early mounts. Okay. At just, her. Yeah, 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 that, know, yeah, she knows what she's doing there, mm. the local, absolutely. Just quickly touch on uh, the two fresh up runners here for me, uh, Diagon Alley uh, and Chavot, uh, both coming into this fresh, but right in the market at $7. Yeah, Diagon Alley, look, the, the word out of the stable is that they're happy on a rain-affected track, they're going to make their way down to the central districts, the James Wellwood team. Naturally, that stable really does excel a month or two into the season, so... Look, it's got, the, it's got the form line in terms of a juvenile and it comes out of an astute stable. There's no money at this stage, so just keep mm. an eye on its fluctuations in terms of race day. It probably needs a lead knowing that it's very first up, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and the other horse you're touching on, Chevro. Yeah, Chevro, yeah, I'm going with. Yep. Yeah, two South Island races, including a third in the Champagne Stakes. Look, the Champagne Stakes, I want to take a set against it, rated very, very poor. Um, yeah, I think $7.00. On my assessment, you may get double figures on the Lisa Ladder Train Galloper. Okay. I thought both its runs down south in terms of speed rating slash figures, it was a little bit below to where it needs to be to winning on Saturday. Okay. BP, surmise the uh, O'Leary Philly stakes for us, and which way would you be uh, having a having a dollar uh, in this year's O'Leary Philly stakes? I, I like Wes X, and I think if the horse can use the barrier draw and, and show some speed to be able to put herself in the race, she gets a very good opportunity, doesn't she, up against the rail. I'd be looking for a power play here, uh, looking in a, in a power play market with, with Wizex and Romancing the Moon, both to run top four, maybe a Wizex to win, Romancing the Moon top four, those type of power plays I, I'm looking around for. Um, so that, they're the two I like. And then Labrazi's obviously the other biggest danger in the race. And from barrier number seven with blinkers on, you'd imagine there's going to be positivity to put the source uh, into the race. So they're the three horses I'm centred around uh, with uh, just a slight inkling towards Wizex. 
Yeah, OK, I understand that. And look, there'll be power plays on all these uh, races come tomorrow afternoon, domestically speaking, so there'll be no problem there. And I'm sure they'll doctor up BP's uh, requested power play. Paul, um, where did you land here in the uh, three-year-old fillies? Well, Stephen Hunt's almost made me change my mind with the Lisa Allpress Wanganui factor. Uh, but I'm going to stick with Labrazzi on top. I do like the way that she uh, fought tough uh, in that rider, uh, rider stakes. Uh, I thought uh, the Anna Clement runner, uh, Rocker Baby, who was, wasn't that far away from uh, mm. Labrazzi at Ōtaki, um, I thought maybe at the price, there's one I might jump on at a top three or a top four. OK, like that, like that uh, line and form there that you're bringing through with Labrazzi, so I can understand why Rocker Baby at $10. Might get a little bit of each way. Uh, Steve, where would you land here if you had to have an investment? <sighs> Gee, if you, if you made me have one, probably go with Romancing the Moon. Yeah. <clears throat> I just know out of that stable they can really improve after one performance and just a little bit of sense of timing around that horse. Yeah, OK. No, very good money. Romancing the Moon has been the mover. Eight into six dollars. We want to have another look at... We want to have a look at the other three-year-old race on the card, the H.E. Dyke, Wanganui Guinea. Steve, race number six. The runners through this market. Yeah, well back commodity early doors, Soph Mays, who's got a very uh, short SP profile and a, and a light career to date, Soph Mays, again out of a punting stable, Alan Sharrick with that jockey on, Lisa Allpress, so a dangerous betting combination, 280 into 240, so a lot of money in the first 24 hours around Soph Mays, accounts are roughly 30% of the hold, Win Express, uh, not friendless, 420 into $4, including a <clears throat> $2,000 bet at 4.2 on Wednesday afternoon. Mm. Outside the top two, Accidental Tourist, because of the warm, some money, um, warm money around the three and the six, something had to give Accidental Tourist 420 out to 480. Uh, Carrigan, 750 out of turn to eight. And the best of the rest is Mr. Mojo Rissin, 11 out to 13. So a little, little bit of specking for She's Dominant, I should mention. $15 hasn't budged since the opening call, mm -hmm. but strong lead around number six in South Mays. Some highly esteemed owners in that eight, She's, uh, she's Dominant. So they'll be expecting a good run. I see a bit of money there, but both favourites here, BP have been well supported, Soph Mays and Win Express, and we go back to that Rider Stakes, and they were both good runs, weren't they? They were, and look, if the Rider Stakes uh, comes to the fore uh, in the first of our features, the O'Leary Stakes, uh, you'd, you'd want to lean on it again uh, for the last of our features, because you get the chance to use Soph Mays, uh, also Win Express, that bounce out of that race, uh, and look, they, they look strong prospects in, in the event, don't they? Look, Soph Mays has had a very good preparation as a two-year-old through those late stakes uh, races, a Castle Town victory, and, and then a very good second when looking like she possibly was, was about to claim uh, Pacific Dragon in that race out of Tadapa. Uh, so, look, I think the form line stacks up. The money's there with her. There's a, there's a lot of good reasons to be sending your, your bets around Soph Mays, to be completely honest with you. Look, Win Express ranged up and looked like was was going to go straight on by. Uh, he was the horse, he was building the momentum out wide in that race, wasn't he? Uh, in the rider's stakes and he just came to the end of his run. He was beaten in, in, in the end of a margin of two and a half lengths. But look, he's still, still a good run from the horse and I know he's a, he's a runner uh, that look will appreciate the conditions. He will get through the conditions. Uh, we've seen that from him throughout the winter. So, yeah, I find it hard to get away from those two. And then you've got Accidental Tourist who put in a really nice turn of foot in inferior ground last time to the races, uh, look, was a horse who had to really do the chasing, badgering the witness, went for home on the point of the bend in that race at Harwater. It gave him a bunny to chase and he really drew, drew that horse in. And of course, badgering the witness has then come out and won a race since. So you've got that little form reference around what that horse has done uh, out of Harwater. But gee, I, I keep coming back to South Mays though. Uh, and what, 2.40 now we're shopping? Yeah, 240, uh, absolutely. Was it, what's 260 on opening, Steve? Was it? 280. 280. 280. Okay, into 240, so the money there. And I know one big Alan Sherrick fan uh, is at Mount Smart Stadium, Paul. Can you get away from Soph Mays? Uh, no, in a word. <laughs> no, I, look, she, she won that, what, won two in a row. Couldn't quite haul in Pacific Dragon in the Ryder Cup. Um, Pacific Dragon has gone on and done very, very good things. So the form's frank there. I really do like the look of that Alan uh, Sherrick runner, Soph Mays, at $2.40. If there was one other, maybe uh, a double-digit runner going round, uh, the Royden Burgesson uh, boasting. Uh, that was a nice second at a Woodville uh, behind a smart one. I think it was Sangrita. Uh, didn't really settle in that race, to be fair. Was coming home strongly. Uh, daughter of Sacred Falls, so 
We know she'll uh, be able to go up a gear, especially with another 140 metres uh, to go on top of uh, the 1,200 she had la uh, last time. So, Sof May's on top for me, but I do like the look of boasting for an each-way go. He sets up for a little power play potentially, Sof May's in uh, boasting top four. Uh, put, uh, Steve, uh, there's no such thing as the Ryder Cup anymore, is there? Or are we still going to have the Ryder Cup? Oh, with the golf and whatnot? <laughs> well, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Paul, Paul's adjusting it with the Ryder Cup. Ryder Stakes, isn't it? Not the Ryder Cup. Ryder Stakes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, tell us about this race. Which way did you go? Oh, I'm very keen on Soph Mays. Uh, you go back to that Ryder Stakes performance at Tadapa. Considering the race shape, as I mentioned, we saw graphically at suited on speed runners, Soph Mays was in that neutral position, had to make a move from the 800 metre mark, and there was no cart in the race. She had to do the dog work to put herself into the race, come the home straight. So she had to make that long sustaining sprint from around about the 800 metre mark. She still had the audacity not to knock up in the last 200, to, but to perform the quickest last 200 in the rider stakes mm. and just about got the job done. So you look at that performance, can she step up to 13.40 on her sectionals last start to Rapa? Absolutely no dramas considering mm. she had to make her run so far out and she was strong in the last furlong and through the line so for me. So I've definitely got her on top. Uh, it's hard to set up the tempo in terms of how strong they'll be with these light three odds. So I'm not sure how hard they'll go, uh, but again, it's got the right jockey the right trainer, Soph Mays, so she's clearly the one to beat. And I wouldn't be surprised if she started between 2 and 2.40. OK, I think we've got a race replay we do want to have a look at. Uh, MJ Concept Construction Limited. Uh, for the guys who got that for us, I don't know what that race rolls. Yeah, Steve. it's the maiden but, one by go. Accidental Tourist. Uh, ah, right. Look, it was a very good performance on the eye, and, and backed up on the clock, you see there, they went out fairly slow, and um, well, the last 639.40, just above par, and the class rating for maiden class was one and a half or 1.8 lengths above par. So it suggests it can take the step up. Yep. As you mentioned, BP mentioned the second horse here, Badger the Witness, who looked home at around about the last 300, just got run over late by the eventual winner, <laughs> an accidental tourist. Uh, Badger the Witness has been a sub winner, as Brendan's alluded. So I think the overall form is good enough. Yep. Just on that figure to what it needs against Soph Mays and the likes, probably has to find two lengths, but they can do that. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lightly raced three-year-old early in the season, they can really spike in performances from one start to another. So okay. um, a little bit surprised it's eased it's 420 out to 480. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably based on how well we, we respected the horse going into the market. Did we open it a touch short and it's now finding its correct mark? Mm. Possibly, but... Okay. Uh, again, I wouldn't be surprised if it firm at some stage during the day, knowing that it comes out of the Mark Walker bar. Yeah, OK. The one also I want to get you to uh, cast your eye over a Corignan uh, there for Kevin Mai. It's got a jockey now, Ashvin Mudhu, aboard. And look, it made a really big impression winning first up at Rick. It looked pretty green, but was very strong to the line. And yeah, don't quite know what happened the second day. They've got ground question mark there. But what about mm. Corignan? I'm not sure about the ground. It maybe just didn't back up the seven days. It was very impressive on the first day of Grand National Day. I was disappointed considering it was so firm in the market. One of the strongest played in the last two to three minutes. Almost traded in the red Carrigan on the last day at Grand National Day. Maybe it was in the IG inferior ground when it got back and cut the corner along the inside. Maybe that was a slight negative in, in why it underperformed in terms of the marketplace. But look, the market has pegged the source as a very good horse. So, mm. again, comes out of the right barn. Kevin Myers, $8. Um, look, I wouldn't be surprised if it touched double figures, knowing the profile on the top three, the Northern Gallopers. Uh, well, Soph Mays in the CD, but Alan Sharrick trained, so no knock there in terms of a betting profile. But no. just with the... The accumulation of money on the three, the six and the one, I wouldn't be surprised if something had to give and it may be number two that's double figures. But yeah, I, w I was disappointed on the eye, uh, knowing that where it sat in the marketplace and where it finished on race day. Yeah, no, fair enough. BP, uh, surmise the Wanganui Guineas, actually start Wanganui Guineas for us and where would you have a bet? Yep, around South Mays, uh, keen to sort of run it through some multis for the weekend. Uh, for a horse who might sit on speed and, and give a sight at a, at a bit of a price is New Orleans Jazz. Uh, running number four. Now, this horse on a quick backup, raced on uh, last Saturday on a heavy surface out of Awapuni. Uh, and uh, look, was gathered in but boxed on in that race. And just might be a horse who, who can find that front position again. Uh, and if there is to be a lack of speed and, and can find that top top spot, uh, might be a, a sneaky top four. Uh, could potentially really drift out in price. It's hovering around sort of the $18, $16 mark. But just with if there's going to be pressure at the top, that means 
uh, horses underneath start lengthening. I, I would be looking at a top four market for that horse. It's currently 250. So again, uh, if we can get a little power play going, please, of uh, <laughs> Soap Mays to win uh, and New Orleans Jazz top four. Thank you. I'll, I'll make it happen, PP. I will make it happen. Paulie, uh, where'd you land in the guineas? Can anyone get away from Soap Mays? Doesn't sound like it. No, and why would you want to? Uh, mm. I've got her on top. I'm happy to take the 240 right now. Um, wouldn't mind a little fixed Cornella as well. I've had a look. Soph Mays into uh, boasting for the fixed Cornella. That's $19. And if the uh, Power Play boys could fix <laughs> out our Soph Mays uh, boasting top four, uh, that'd be very, very nice. Leave it with me. Leave it with me, gentlemen. I'll, uh, I'll make sure they're there for you tomorrow afternoon. Power pay is on every race. OK, intermission time. Gentlemen, intermission time on the leg up, which means it's time for another edition of wildly popular Minute with Moate. Hi, I'm Courtney. Uh, I'm talking to you I'm 22 years old and I'm a professional netball player. Here's your Minute with Moati. Who has been your biggest influence in racing? Um, James McDonald. What was the first car you owned? Um, it was an Audi. Uh, toilet paper, over or under? Oh, over. Uh, most famous person in your phone contacts? Um, Stephen Maher. Uh, your go-to karaoke song? Um, Dancing in the Moonlight. Uh, your favourite NRL team? Uh, anyone but the Warriors. <laughs> your favourite junk food? <laughs> Chocolate. Who has it easier, jockeys or trainers? Oh, trainers, definitely. Uh, your favourite board game? Um, Twister. <laughs> That's a big board. <laughs> union or league? Um, union. Uh, fill in the blank. The best Barrett brother is? Um, Bowden. Uh, your first celebrity crush? Oh, um, Justin Bieber. Which player would you most like to see at the Warriors next season? Um, Anton Leonard Brown. Uh, favourite horse you've ever ridden? Oh, include or final touch. You can invite three people to a dinner party. Who would they be? Um, the guy off Peaky Blinders. <laughs> um, the guy off Purple Hearts. And the guy that plays Elvis. <laughs> Race you'd most like to win? Oh, I'll crack a million. Uh, a horse we should be keeping an eye out for this season. Look at his split. Uh, with the darts on, the, can you give us your best 180? <laughs> 180! <laughs> Thanks, Courtney. Oh, you have to take the bit out about the Warriors. <laughs> Anyone but the Warriors. Anyone but the Warriors. Uh, it's unfortunate, but thank you to Courtney Bards uh, for playing along there. And first car was an Audi, Steve. She's not oh, bad. Yeah. Yeah, living large, Courtney Bards. And lickety split with horse to follow. Well, yeah, you could have certainly done worse there with Lickety Split coming out and winning up there at Ruakaka. OK, guys, Rickerton, well done, Paul, by the way. Yeah, well done up there uh, with your uh, minute with Mawadi. I'm sure we'll have another segment uh, next week. But now we want to get on to Rickerton. I want to have a look at the three-year-old feature down there, the Murray Gillanders Memorial. Three-year-old over 1,000 metres, Steve. And look, it's fair to say uh, Tiakia dominating this market as well. They are with the stable mates of Melbourne Bay and Grace and Grey. 240 each of two. Originally, Grace and Grey went up five. Does hold the highest amount of money, does Grace and Grey, but it hasn't budged since the opening call where Melbourne Bay, 240, got as high as 250, brought back into 240. So 240 each of two, but in terms of dollars invested, a slight lead around number six. And then there's a big separation. The second division headed by Redmond at $10 with That's Charming. That's Charming, the third best bat runner. So maybe one to include in those exotic fixed odds bet types on race day. Uh, Shazza has gone in a couple of points, $12 to $10. And then best of the rest is Turf War, 11 out to 13. So yeah, it's all about the two Tiaki, our train gallopers, with a slight lead around number six, Grace and Gray, purely down to dollars invested. Yeah, OK, she was good last prep. She's first up. Uh, BP, Grace and Gray and Marlborough Bay a run under the belt. So uh, how do we approach this one? I, I really like Grace and Gray. Um, I, I thought this horse showed uh, enormous potential uh, last season uh, and was a, a runner that was on a path towards uh, the, the, the Karaka Million and, and looked to be one of the leading chances for the stable leading towards the Karaka Million uh, purely because it did beat Dynastic uh, in that race too uh, on, on Boxing Day. Uh, to it leading towards the Karaka Million. Things didn't happen for the horse and she had to be put out for a spell. 
Well, she's come back with a really good trial. I, I, I like how she's uh, attacked the line. Khufu, yeah, Khufu's gone very hard in a couple of trials. Um, Avondale trial and, and even on Tuesday um, uh, at the Avondale, at the Ruakaka trials, uh, he's gone very quickly in, in both of his trials that he's been gathered in. But he was gathered in by Grace and Gray in the concluding stages on an off track. She's just got a lot of class about her. I like, I like her a lot in the race. I mean, Tiako, have already, they've shown their hand early in the South Island, haven't they, with that synthetic race meeting, just to say that they, they are going to be a massive force uh, in the next few weeks in the South, uh, building towards that cup meeting in Marlborough Bay. Uh, well, I mean, how can you ignore him? I mean, he's a horse who's run second behind Fellini in a very good race out of, out of Taupo. Um, he's the son of Darcy Brahma, who looked very good when he won uh, on debut. Hard to split. But if I was to pick one out of the two, uh, I'd be, I'm leaning towards Grace and Gray with just that pure talent she showed last preparation. Paul, what are your initial thoughts here? Uh, two Tiaki, our runners dominating this market, and uh, what do we wait for a push? We've probably got one around Grace and Gray to some degree. Yeah, I can understand uh, BP's confidence around Grace and Gray. Um, obviously, uh, beating the. Uh, crack a million winner dynastic, but uh, I don't mind the look of that Marlborough Bay myself. Uh, I thought that uh, run at uh, Topol, that uh, runner-up behind Fellini, was very, very good. No stranger to the winner's circle either, uh, having won as a two-year-old. Uh, and the two that ran second and third uh, in that race went on to Quinella, the futurity. So um, I actually have got Marlborough Bay on top. Uh, don't mind it. I think, uh, what are we at the moment? 2.40 on Marlborough Bay. OK, it's going to be a bit of a race like that, Steve, isn't it, with these two sort of dominating and you've got to sort of pick your pick your sides, don't you, really? Because as you say, we're out to $10 for a third favourite, so it's quite quite the market, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's going to be intriguing the last five to ten minutes of trading. Can they separate the two TRKRP? I've got no doubt there will be a separation, but... We'll go back to Marlborough's Bay's uh, first up performance at Taupo. I think we've got yeah. a, a video snippet here, Thaddeus. Yeah. And bounces a very strong race, the number one ranked race on the day at Taupo. Uh, was the Fellini 1,100 metres for three-year-olds. It's got stakes form uh, out of this particular race from the juvenile um, profile. So you see there to the 600, 32.54, 6.3 lengths below pass. So they've really sprinted home. So it's suited on speed runners. You see there Fellini. Uh, with the blinkers on, very professional type, was shown pr to be very professional as a juvenile, um, third in the Karaka million, so Fellini is a top class horse and got the job done late over Melbourne Bay who boxed on well there for second. The advantage coming out of that race, Melbourne Bay, is that it has race fitness potentially over Grace and Grey who they both bounce out of that same trial. Subsequently Melbourne Bay has had a race under uh, its belt, um, which could be valuable when we're hitting a, a testing track at Rickerton. Now it's presently, I think, currently a, a heavy eight, um, so it's down the chute. So it's look, it's a thousand metres. Um, I'm sure Grace and Grey won't, won't be too far off the mark, knowing that it's only only a thousand metres. But maybe the last 150 Melbourne Bay, if there's a slight advantage, could be towards that individual, knowing that it's had the race under its belt. Michael McNabb jumps on board Melbourne Bay. Uh, it's drawn a wide gate, but that's no knockdown the shoot as we know at record. And if it can sit three, four wide with a little bit of cover, or if potentially Melbourne Bay wants to sit in the first two, uh, no dramas there. It's shown to have tactical speed as well. So maybe if that was the, the slight advantage towards Melbourne Bay, having the better of Grace and Grey, because on figures, Grace and Grey hits probably roughly 2.2 two, two lengths in terms superior over Marlborough Bay to what they've found, but I mean, they're both light in Korea, so uh, that can change race by race, but maybe that fitness edge might, might make Marlborough Bay, Marlborough Bay mm. a chance to beat Grace and Grey. Okay, interesting. Anything else there on the page that strikes you? I see Shaz has got some good form. That's charming. He's taking a little bit of money first up at $10, so a couple at $10 there we might need to mention. Yeah, look, Shaz, I prefer that form around Carrigan over the Champagne Stakes form as a juvenile. The Champagne, Champagne Stakes form, uh, which does as dramatic, one. Uh, I just want to take a set against that. As I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, it was a, a very poor a speed rating. Um, so horses that bounced out of that particular race is Redmond and Turf War. 
Uh, you see Redmond at $10, Turf War at $13. So I want to take a set against those two individuals. I just don't think they have the numbers to match the Tiakau pair. But if there was one in that middle market, that second division, probably Shazza. I think dropping back in trip suits from 12 to 1,000 metres to a horse that likes to run and just peaked in the last 150 and Carrigan got the better of it. So I like that Carrigan form line over the Champagne Stakes as a two-year-old form line. OK, that's interesting in itself. Uh, BP, uh, sounds like Grayson Gray. Anything down the page you need to be mentioning here for our viewers? Yeah, I, I, I thought Shazza was the other one that we could mention. Um, we all know a Shazza, don't we? Uh, you know, so um, go on, Shazza, yeah, go and get it done. Uh, so um, that's, that's what I'm sure punters will be thinking here, that Shazza can get something done here uh, in race number three. Uh, so maybe a top three, top four um, for those that are looking to try and play into those uh, different markets. So you could go plain and boring here and take the Cornella. Um, the fixed Cornella currently between the two Tiako runners is $2.80 uh, on one and six, six and one. Uh, so if you, if you were for that way inclined and didn't know how to break the two down, you could, you could just explore the Cornella uh, yeah. around the two runners and then a little bit of Shazza uh, for top four. <laughs> Shazza for that power play. I see she's getting four kgs off Megan Taylor aboard. Uh, so that'll be a beneficial down to 51, Paul. You probably had that fixed Quinella lined up already, I would have thought. No, no, I can understand why you're uh, having a little uh, dabble on Shazza. I'm going to go a little more upmarket from Shazza and go Daisy Door, uh, first starter. Uh, but the trial went down at uh, Ashburton. I think uh, Mosley really had to ask her to do a lot. Uh, she didn't look uh, the worst there. And out at, uh, what is she now? $31.550 for a top three. Um, I wouldn't mind a little piece of Daisy Door. OK, 31s for Daisy Door. This is by Savile Row, Steve, the uh, stallion. At, mm. uh, yeah, OK. Yep. Are they obviously three now? Are they the oldest of three, Savile Row? Yeah, I believe so. I think he had a, a two-year-old winner in the Central Districts from memory, Savile Row. So, son of Mac Fee. He's got some uh, young horses coming through the ranks. OK, so BP's Grace and Grey, Paulie's Marlborough Bay. You're the deciding vote uh, in the uh, three-year-old feature from Rickerton. Well, the, the market's telling me it's an 82% chance that the winner will come out of the Tiakau bar. No, I think the 280 fixed odds is, is a gift. Quinella. Yeah, for the Quinella. I think that's a, a pretty good mark. Mm -hmm. um, I think there will be separation between these two uh, mm -hmm. come race day and very close to race start. Uh, I think that's a given. Which one it is, I do not have a clue. Okay. Um, but I, I can see one of them really driving late in the marketplace and possibly starting odds on, but that purely might come down to the word out of the stable. OK, interesting. Yeah, no, good honesty there, by the way. It's going to be tricky. We don't know yet, do we? Who's it going to no, be? No, we don't. No, we don't. Okay. No, fair enough. OK, that's going to be an intriguing race. $2.80 for that fixed Quinella, if you're that way inclined, and why wouldn't you be? Um, guys, we want to have a look at Tirapa. Tirapa's got an excellent card on Sunday, Steve. Uh, we've got the Pakaranga Hunt. We've got the Hurdle feature there as well. Um, so, A couple and, of decent flat races. And a couple of decent flat races, and we want to have a look at race number seven on the card. Uh, and this is the tw over the 1,200 metres, the RMS Contractors 1,200 metres, and some pretty nice horses resuming and some pretty nice horses full stop here. A tricky race to assess, uh, Thaddeus. A lot of horses here resuming um, at a distance short of their best. A lot of horses here will be looking towards Hawke's Bay, potentially the second and third day, maybe the Livermore Classic. So yeah, it'll be a nice starting point and a nice foundation heading towards some bigger riches in the spring. $4.50, Chief 2. Now, look, this, this, this market's just opened the last 30 to 60 minutes, so little in terms of lead slash money flow, but four fifty each of 2 on the bubbles, Miss Cartier. Malt time is trialled up very well on the I-550 in the third line. Ballon Rouge and Madalenia, $7.59 respectively. Uh, La, 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 uh, La Bella Beals, no, no jockey here. Look, Stephen Marsh has about three or four in this race, and there's no jockey in La Bella Beals, so... Whether it starts remains to be seen, but it's the only other runner in single figures at $9. Uh, Bari at 13 Illumination again, no jock there for Stephen Marsh at $18. Uh, Red Inferno also with wind speed, $18, the pair there. So, yeah, sticky race, uh, hard one to assess. On the bubbles has had one run uh, leading in, disappointed at Ruakaka. Has that man Opie Bossen aboard, who's not riding on Saturday, take note. So Opie Bossen aboard on the bubbles, if that's the lead possibly if he had the choice of two or three out of the uh, out of the Tiakau barn but yeah as I say we've just opened this market so no money lead. Okay speaking of where's Opie on Saturday sorry did you say? Uh, not riding not, not riding, riding. Okay. Uh, he's got a, a reasonable book at Tarapa um, but I having see. the Saturday off you could say. Okay we see a little bit of money for him in the premiership because I see he's shortened up a little bit Opie Bossom interesting. 
He has. Uh, next Saturday, I'm going to bring up a graphic around Opie Bosson uh, mm -hmm. compared to how well he's travelling in the first month of the season, August, to yeah. how he's trended in the last six or seven years mm -hmm. in the early start of the season come August and September. So I'll bring those stats okay. up next uh, next week, but yeah. yes, Premiership, we have seen a little bit of money in the last 24 hours for Opie. Okay, that is interesting. Keep my eye on that and look forward to those statistics. BP, race number seven, RMS contract is 1,200. Well, we've got some good ones uh, in amongst this lot, haven't we? Yeah, it's a cracking field. It really is. It's, it's a beauty. Um, we're, there's so many talking points uh, around the race. Uh, the, the, the top three in the Tangerine, I mean, they, they all deserve respect in their own right, don't they? I mean, you've got Bell on Rouge, who won uh, a Group 1 uh, at her last start to the race, has been winning the New Zealand Oaks and had a super season as a three-year-old filly overall. Uh, we thought maybe she'd had, had come to her peak uh, before the New Zealand Oaks, won the Oaks, paying $26. Prior to that, she'd won races like the Eulogy and the 8 Carat. Uh, you've got uh, a former Group 1 winner and on the bubbles in the race. Uh, you've got Emeralina, where we're just waiting to see the best of her form. I thought very late in her trial, it w w was good at, at Topol. She, she got back in that trial and she did overdo it uh, in second last position and just wanted to throw her head around. But once she was able to quicken up down the straight, she was, she was better through the line. This is a race where you could go away from those uh, Tiako runners and, and explore. There's two horses I want to have a bet on in the race. One of them's Malt Time. I, I, gee, I've just got this feeling about Malt Time doing something this season. Uh, th this horse ran fourth in the Lightning Handicap last preparation. She's come back with a very good trial under her belt. I like the trial at Avondale where she's got to the outside fence and she has won it very nicely. So she looks ready to go first up. She's drawn well in barrier number four. Problem is she, she's a horse who can't really use good barrier draws. She hasn't normally put herself in a, in a good forward position in the past, but if she can find herself a half-decent spot, I thought she was a bet. And Bari, Bari at $13. A horse who's got an impeccable fresh-up record. Most recent trial was OK. Uh, you, you look at it and you see the, uh, the, the, the nice little UP next to it, uh, which I'm, a lot of trainers love running a UP uh, at the trials. <laughs> Uh, and this horse finished around about fifth position but was not tested down the straight. Will get through track conditions and Taylor Mitchell aboard who has been in superb form. She's riding well, Taylor. She's making the most of her claim. This horse gets down to 51 kilos. Uh, he'll be getting some of mine. What about the... Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Does, think, it need yeah. a, does it need a wetter BP yeah, what's the track I mean, be? It's well, a soft, a heavy eight at the moment. I thought it was... We learnt last season it really needs a heavy, like heavy 10 range. I, look, it's supposed to rain before the test match, uh, which will help Argentina at the 14 and a half point start. So, uh, if that is the case, <laughs> um, and the rain does come, uh, because it is supposed to be, it's supposed to pelt down over the next couple of days. That's that was the report anyway. So, if if it does happen that way, it has to play into his hands. Um, if it doesn't, look, it's still going to be wet enough, though, isn't it? I mean, yes, I know that track played a lot better than last weekend than may be expected. Um, I, I know you were saying, Stephen, it was more maybe in that heavy nine bracket uh, in the end rather than that heavy ten. So we know that the track does, it, it can cop rain and it drains well and, and that's how the, the Tadapa track plays. But just purely on him getting through track conditions that are going to be in the softer heavy bracket and also in a fresh up state, he, he just might be worth a dollar or two. Yeah, OK, no, absolutely. Uh, Bari, as you say, three from three on the heavy. So if we do get that rain, you'd be stepping in. Paul. Um, what are your thoughts here? It's a tricky old race, isn't it? It, it is, um, but it's made a wee bit easier by the fact that uh, Stephen just mentioned we've taken money on Opie to win the Premiership. He's on uh, on the bubbles, <laughs> uh, and you'd have to think he gets the pick of the runners at Tiago. So I'm very, very happy to uh, jump on on the bubbles. I know it was a slightly, maybe a slightly disappointing run uh, last yeah. time out. Um, I'm sure they'll bounce back this time and me and BP were singing from the same hymn sheet. I really like the look of Bari as well. Uh, as he said, gets down to 51 kilos with that three kilo claim with Taylor Mitchell. Um, fresh up, a very, very good record. And I think the track will be uh, tough enough uh, to see the goods produced by Bari. Yep, love the price at around 30. So it sounds like uh, myself, uh, and BP would like Bari in some sort of power play uh, <laughs> later on today. You go, put them in an email, gents, and I'll cycle. You've got that many, I've, I'm going to forget. But OK, we'll do something around Bari for you. Uh, Steve, what do we make of on the bubbles? I mean, probably, they sent it forward at uh, Ruakaka, and 
Look, faded late. Uh, we know the quality of the horse. Um, you know, as you say, a night doesn't look great in resuming. I think what it doesn't show on paper form, it was friendless. For a horse that has been yeah. a losing liability for every start from my memory bank on the bubbles as a juvenile as a three-year-old, we're losing a stack on this horse. There's a big syndicate involved. It was untouched. We couldn't write a ticket on the bubbles first mm. up at Ruakaka. Mm. So there was obviously natural improvement, a lot of beneficial coming out of that uh, run uh, in terms of fitness levels on the bubbles. Uh, how much you can take out of its trial? Look, it's never trialled up well on the bubbles. I think one or two occasions it's trialled up okay in the first two, but overall its trials have been uh, fear on the eye and the stable when Jamie used to train the horse was never concerned. So I don't think you can read too much in terms of the trial. The track conditions is a slight concern. Um, look, it has to carry a reasonable weight of 59 kilograms on the bubble. So, look, I wouldn't be uh, opposing customers to back against on the bubbles. I think uh, it's an opportunity to do so. It heads the market at 450 each of two with Miss Cardia. I'm very keen on Miss Cardia and Malt Time, one of BP selections in Malt Time. I do think this is a, a sense of timing around a campaign for number seven Malt Time. Could be a genuine open class. Uh, handicap galloper on the minimum find a really good stakes race in the next two to three months and Miss Cartier who's trialled up well first trial was okay second trial was real eye-catching and the forms bounced out of that particular trial Miss Cartier uh, was good enough to finish third and flying stakes at Alperni and behind Germanicus and Brando their two stakes performed gallopers so and it's drawn an I ideal gate to just be on speed so they're probably the two I was leaning towards but a yeah sticky race okay Tricky surmise, BP. I see Malt Time, one of your top selections, BP, owned by Bill and Carrie Borry, and that be Bill mm. Borry, I presume, Miss Potential fame. Absolutely, yeah, yep, mm. yep. Carries the colours too uh, of uh, of Miss Potential. Uh, so, look, look, I think that's what we saw from last season. She she looks like a horse um, that, that that's got the right talent. She's clearly come back in, in great fashion. Uh, it was a really good trial from her. So, look, I'll mark her as my top selection in the race. And look, Steve is. I mean, it is a sticky race, and if you, if you like one, you might as well run with it. So, Malt Time, top selection, each way uh, around Bari, uh, runner number five. Just had a quick look. 100% chance of rain on Saturday. Of course, this race meeting is on Sunday, and the likelihood that the bull will be off and gone by then. So, how much of an effect that will have on the track, we'll know uh, by the time we roll around to the first race, just before midday. Yeah, OK. Paul, uh, where are you having a bit here in the, uh, the feature sprint there at Tadapa? Uh, on the bubbles on top for me. I'll take the 450. Uh, thank you very much. And just like BP, a little each way go on Bari. Very good. $13 Bari resuming. Uh, and a good trial leading into it. OK, guys, thanks for your efforts there. Steve, um, it's book giveaway time. Book giveaway time. Now, hello. What have you got here? Oh. Tell us about this. <laughs> yeah, well, <we're> heavy. <laughs> Elite. Elite. Yeah. Mm, so it's a 360-page publication compiled by Trackside's own Aidan Rodley. Mm. Showcases New Zealand Premier Racing from group enlisted races going back to the late 70s to the present. We're more focused on recent Group 1 or uh, group enlisted uh, races. So it's got in-depth stats. So I'm just in the first couple of pages of reading yeah. my personal book at home. Thank you, Aidan. And uh, look, it's got... Uh, graphic stats around jockeys when it comes to group enlisted races, training stats, uh, fantastic photos, uh, a genuine hard yeah. cover copy and, yeah. and the photos inside, there's plenty of them going through all our best thoroughbreds in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, racing images, Trish Janelle, who's well respected in terms yeah. of photography in the Incredible North Island. Incredible photos in there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah it's, it's vintage photos. So. Yeah. Look, uh, early doors in terms of personally reading it, but uh, no, can't, well, can't wait to dive into it in the next few weeks. OK, we've got one to give away here, team, mm -hmm. for our uh, loyal viewers. I know there's thousands upon thousands of you, but you need to answer a question. Who was the last horse to win the Foxbridge Tarzino double, and what year did it happen? Now, send your entries in to the email address that's about to come onto your screen, which I believe is the leg up at TAB. .co.nz. Get your entries in to win Elite. Who was the last horse to win the Foxbridge Tarzino double and what year as well? The leg up at tab.co.nz. So that is no bad little giveaway. Uh, second week, we'll keep building on that, but thanks to Aidan because uh, mm. it's an impressive looking book, isn't it? Yep, and uh, he's got a, a nice pedigree behind a maiden in terms of developing, ripping uh, uh, books. Yeah. Um, so in the last five to ten years, so uh, this is no different and probably his best work to date, personally I'd suggest that. So uh, it's taken a lot of time, he's gone through all different racing personnels to get in depth 
information over the last 20 to 30 years, so it's taken a lot of time from Aidan Rodley to develop this. Okay. I know it's been a, a long project, but it's yep. finally in stores and online, so get involved. Hefty, isn't it? Hefty. Oh, it's a heavy piece of work, yeah. <laughs> the leg up at tab.co.nz, Foxbridge Tarzino double, last horse to do it, and the year, right. Best bet time, gentlemen. Uh, look, I don't want to say it, but I think we went over for three last week. Uh, BP, we'll start with you. Get us back on track. What's your best bet this weekend? All right. OK, well, I'm going to go to work for a jumping race uh, on Sunday. Uh, but a horse who has won impressively on the flat this season, and it's this bloke here in very flash. Do like very flash on Sunday. Lines up in race number two. You would have thought that maybe uh, he'd bounced out. He was jumping in the right race last time to the races, but he was beaten by Rocking Good Time, who was strongly pushed by uh, Sean Phelan to get the job done on that occasion uh, in his hurdling debut, but uh, no disgrace in that. Peso is in the race, uh, who could be a little fly in the ointment for Very Flash because it's out of the right stable of McDougall and Nelson. Uh, and as we know, Peso is what group one place in a, in a liver mole uh, a number of years ago. Uh, but uh, this one of those horses that could be wary of, but I'm keen to be around Very Flash with that first up experience over the jumps. Look, he'd be short on, but um, he lines up on what is a super day of jumps race. We spoke about yeah. race seven, been a great uh, flat race. Yeah. Uh, boy, you have a look at that, that hurdle race as we're oh. counting down to the Great Northern. You know, Nedwin, Dr. Hank, Aaron yeah. Kudu's taking a ride on Nedwin uh, as well, which is important to note it. And Sean Phelan will be riding Dr. Hank. Yeah, that does that in the hurdle, as you say, in particular looks a ripple. We, we'll have that market out shortly, won't we, Steve, with any luck? Yeah, probably the next 60 minutes. Kajino okay. also to add into the mix will be riding commission, so okay. it's a ripping hurdle. OK, Paul, you're our star performer. Uh, show us the way here with your bet of the week. Yeah, to be fair, I've never been very good fresh up, so I'll be better for that gallop <laughs> under my belt now. Uh, I'm going to head to Whanganui and the Whanganui Guineas. Uh, and as uh, I think Stephen mentioned before, Lisa Allpress, it's a very, very good record at Whanganui, and she's on Soph Mays in the Whanganui Guineas. Uh, picked up a couple of very nice wins as a two-year-old. Comes out of that rider, uh, not cup, sorry. I've got golf on my mind, <laughs> the rider stakes. Um, so Soph Mays for me, 240 all day. Yeah, absolutely, and been heavily back too, so that's good encouragement. Steve, where did you land? Uh, for your bit of the week this week. Yeah, I'll go back to Whanganui, race five halfway through the card. The Open 1340, Secret and more. Look, she presents first up uh, for the Patterson Stable. The key around her, when she resumed last campaign under the stable, she won first up at this grade and course on the back of one trial. Her trial leading in was super on the eye. Uh, you go back last preparation, all three runs were outstanding, including second up when she ran uh, third in the Rotorua Stakes. It was clearly the best run in a, a quality field yep. at Ottawa Park. So okay. um, she definitely has the measure in terms of the, the best figure in this race. She just needs the right tempo. She can be a low percentage play in terms of where she maps, but I've got Secret and more okay. as my best bet at Whanganui. Very good. Very good, gentlemen. I see you're still in front, plus seven. Well done, Steve. Uh, long mark continue. OK, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, Paulie, uh, for joining us in your uh, tour from Mount Smart, all the stadiums of New Zealand. Uh, no deductions, bonus back blitzes, it's all happening this weekend? Certainly is, yep. No deductions, as you mentioned, uh, Thad, and the uh, bonus back blitz, the first four races uh, from the two domestic meetings and the two major meetings over in Australia. And as I look behind me now, the Warriors are just having their captains run. We are expecting plenty of tries tomorrow on Saturday. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. Cheers, BP. Uh, big weekend. Warriors, All Blacks. We've got, we haven't even talked about the Australian galloping, so couch will be a good place to be. Yeah, it looks, it looks an inviting place, doesn't it? Uh, and so does Mount Smart, doesn't it, for the big games at the end of the season. Uh, a little bit of Dallin and Cozy and Fafita certainly will be uh, out there for punters on what should be a game that we are host to tries. But yeah, let's hope the All Blacks get back on track. Uh, well, can they? They didn't make any changes. Let's hope they do uh, on, on Saturday. Yeah, I echo those sentiments. We need to see a win at short notice. OK, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Steve Fury. Fitz. Looking forward to Saturday. You'll be 1,000, 2,000 yeah. guineas reopen today, later on this afternoon, right, we'll on the of... back of official nominations. The Couplins New Zealand Cup will open either Tuesday or Wednesday next week, futures okay. betting. Excellent. Thanks for that. Plenty of futures out there to get stuck into, future proof and play as well. We thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again seven days' time on The League Up.